yeah, let me first thanks for organizing this event and every one of you for your contributions during today and, and yesterday. Uh, that definitely, uh, I learned a lot in this process. Uh, today, I will introduce the role of traditional knowledge in the Cumin Montreal Global Pervasive Framework, which was uh, adopted in um, last COP. But before we dive in, dive in, 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 the, in the framework, just like, let, let me reflect on the convention that in 1992 already recognized the crucial role of traditional knowledge in the three of its objectives. Traditional knowledge has been integral for conservation and sustainable use, as well as efforts and increase in accessing and sharing benefits delivered from uh, traditional knowledge utilizations. While we commonly uh, use the abbreviation TK or traditional knowledge, it is essential to remember that Article 8J of the Convention speaks about knowledge, innovation, and practices of indigenous people and local communities. As discussed uh, yesterday, knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge is passed from generation to generation, but it has a unique adapt form of to contemporary, contemporarily adapt to the challenges that it faced. Uh, this sometimes is called traditional innovation. Uh, in front of you, you have the four uh, TK, uh, the four articles that uh, recognize the contribution of indigenous people in the convention. Then mainly it's Article 8J on traditional knowledge, Article 10C on customized sustainable use, which is a specific uh, form of sustainable use. Article uh, 17 that speaks, speaks about exchange of information and repatriation of knowledge. The CBD has adopted voluntary guidelines for the repatriation of traditional knowledge, and Article uh, 18, 4 in this paragraph that speaks about indigenous and traditional technologies. This whole set of articles is what we call Article AJ and related provisions. So the Kumi Montreal Global Barbesti Framework uh, set out an ambitious pathway toward achieving the 2050 vision living in harmony with nature. It was adopted after four years of consultation and negotiations, and the framework aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals and builds on the previous uh, strategic plans. So far, the convention has adopted four, uh, sorry, three um, uh, strategic plans, and this one, uh, the, the last one, is known as the Kumi Montreal Global Basic Framework. Another uh, feature during these negotiations was that the, the development of the framework include the participation of indigenous people and local communities, not only at COP, but in all the steps uh, developing the framework. Also, uh, before we move into the specific target, I just would like to highlight the section C, which is, was, uh, which is titled the consideration for the implementation of the Kumi Montreal Global Basic Framework. During the negotiations, these elements were at some stage part of the uh, proposed draft target, but uh, then uh, parties decided to put all these elements in a specific section, which is section C. Among the sections, just to highlight uh, uh, section A on contribution and rights of indigenous people and local communities, section B on different values system, which actually uh, builds on the work of uh, IPES, it was produced uh, early today. Uh, um, uh, important element that is a significant step uh, in comparison to the previous strategic plan is a human rights-based approach, uh, uh, as well as elements on gender. Now, the framework uh, comprises of 23 action-oriented targets uh, for 2030, providing a comprehensive roadmap for biodiversity effort. I, I won't be able to go for uh, describe every of the targets, but just let me to highlight the ones that have a specific reference to indigenous people and local communities. Uh, it's important also to highlight that, again, in section C tell us that the rights of indigenous people is a cross-cutting element of the framework, but an additional emphasis was needed, and that was uh, what parties expressed. Uh, an emphasis reflects uh, that uh, in many of the targets, indigenous people and local communities are reflected. This is such as the case for uh, the target on regards to conservation and restoration, target uh, 
uh, one and three focuses on uh, conservation efforts aiming to reduce biodiversity loss and restore degraded system. Target one emphasized the importance of participatory, integrated, and biodiversity inclusive special planning and management uh, processes. Target two aims to restore at least 30% of degraded terrestrial inland water, marine, and coastal ecosystem by 2030. And the most famous one is the uh, target three or 30 by 30, which seeks to conserve at least 30% of land, waters, and sea ensuring effect, effective protection and management through well-connected systems of protected areas, OECMs, and uh, indigenous territories. In all this, um, there is a, sp a specific call of recognizing and respecting the rights of indigenous people and local communities, including over their traditional territories. In regards to customary, uh, customized sustainable use, Target a five of nine focus on sustainable use of biodiversity, ensuring a safe and legal harvesting of traits of wild species. Target, target five aims to ensure that the use, harvesting, and trade of wild species are sustainable, preventing over exploitation and mining impact of non target species on an ecosystem. Target nine focuses on ensuring that management and use of wild species provide social, economic, and environmental benefits for people, especially. For those who most depend on biodiversity. In both targets, um, there is a specific call for protecting and encouraging customized sustainable use by indigenous people and local communities. Target uh, 13 speaks about increasing sharing of benefits from genetic resources, digital, digital sequence information, and traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. Target um, uh, 22 and 23 speaks about the uh, ensuring participation in decision making and access to justice and information related to biodiversity. It includes uh, different groups, including indigenous people, local communities, women, youth, persons with disabilities, and protection of uh, environmental human rights defenders. Target 23 speaks about ensuring a gender equality and a gender responsive approach for biodiversity action. Now, let me just uh, highlight some of the elements of Target 22 in regards to knowledge uh, uh, is available and accessible. So this, this target has two, two parts, but it's important that we read this as just one part. The call, the, the, the available data, information, and knowledge are accessible to decision makers, practitioner, public, uh, uh, the public to guide effective and equitable governance, integra integrate, and participatory management of biodiversity. The second element of this target is to speak about that in this context, traditional knowledge, innovation, and practices and technologies of indigenous people and local communities should only be accessible with the free prior informed consent in accordance with national legislation. The objective during the negotiation of this uh, target was that to acknowledge that the best available knowledge to guide policy is uh, all this different system of knowledge. At the first iteration of, the, of this uh, um, of target 21, uh, the reference to traditional knowledge was included at the very beginning so it could read the, the ensuring uh, knowledge, including traditional knowledge. But it was also highlighted, highlighted during the negotiations that indigenous people want to balance uh, access to this knowledge, but as well safeguarding, in particular, free prime from consent to access this knowledge. So the best way that uh, the negotiations could lead to draft this, it was to, again, this call for ensuring knowledge um, to decision making, and then a specific section that says that traditional knowledge, uh, which serves to guide policy, should be accessed within uh, with this safeguard of free prior informed consent. I just want to highlight that element, but because again, this is an important balance that I think is was part also as well of this discussion. No traditional knowledge could help, along with uh, science, along with other knowledge, to guide policy. But in order to access traditional knowledge, we also need to take into account these safeguards of free prime from consent to access 
that knowledge. So let me, uh, uh, as I'm concluding my, my presentation, just highlight some of the elements uh, that also uh, uh, that also co 15 adopt to to implement the the um, a framework. Uh, well, during co 15 there was a different set of, of of other tools, other elements, other decisions that ha that aim to help the implementation of the framework, including a, a, a gender plan of action, the resource of mobilization, and monitoring elements. But two elements that speak directly to indigenous people is uh, decision 1510 which speaks about the development of a new program of work and institutional arrangement or Article 8J and other provisions of the convention related to indigenous people and local communities. In Geneva last year, we have the 12th session of the working group. And you, you see it here at the opening, we have uh, Elder Kenneth Deer, Deer who opened the, the, the session. The question here is that uh, the ask for COP15 that aligns with the framework. Uh, the, the ASEC and the, and the current proposed text of the new program of work includes uh, eight elements, and it's a different with the previous one, which had six elements. These new two elements speak about uh, access to funding for indigenous people and local communities and a human rights-based approach. Uh, when we look at the institutional arrangement, the question is, what is the mechanisms within the CBD to ensure the participation of indigenous people and local communities? Currently, parties will decide at COP16 uh, if, the, if the best institutional arrangement is to keep the working group, that is an inter intergovernmental body of, to keep the working group, to integrate the issue of indigenous people. So we won't have a working group, but the agenda, it, we will have a standing agenda item in all the subsidiary bodies, including COP about indigenous people and local communities. Or the third option is to establish a subsidiary body, a permanent subsidiary body that would serve as a platform for parties and indigenous people to address the implementation of this set of articles. Similarly, uh, decision 1512, that is uh, the joint uh, program uh, with UNESCO, IUCN, and the Secretariat on um, how to better uh, understand the links between cultural and biological diversity. Uh, uh, in the picture, we have the summit that it was organized during COP15, and of course, now we're working with our partners to organize the next Nature and Culture Summit during COP16 in Cali. And um, and my final slide is an uh, invitation to join us to the 16th meeting of the Conference of Party, which takes place from the uh, 21st October and 1st November 2020, this, uh, this year in Cali, Colombia. Um, uh, the main elements that the, the COP will decide is on the monitoring framework. Among the monitoring framework, there are uh, four um, uh, uh, indicators on traditional knowledge. The main headline indicator is on traditional occupation, along with the decision on institutional arrangement, the new program of work, and the and, uh, iteration of the um, uh, nature and culture program. With this, I thank you for your time. And <laughs>